the very most valuable piece of advice I've ever received in my life was very simple. It said, don't think so much. <laughs> our thoughts have a way of betraying us, and those thoughts that emanate from our minds truly often force us to take our eyes off the ball. Only those, only those ideas that come from our heart are the ones that truly matter. So today I'm going to ask all of you to use your hearts for the next 15 minutes, more than your minds. And if I can just reach one person in their heart, I'll have a successful talk here today. I've got three truths that I, f I find very dear to my heart that I want to share with you right now. Number one, <laughs> we're all connected, right? TED Talk 101, you got to do a Star Wars uh, reference. <laughs> we are all connected by a hidden force, and it's that force that gives the Jedi his or her powers. Number two, the things that we build really matter. Uh, Dwayne spoke earlier about how actions speak louder than words. The things we build scream, and especially those things that we build with public financing or slave labor, they really scream. <laughs> And number three, and most important, play is perfect. Play is our entree into the world of our bodies and our outside world. Play is quite literally how we learn. So I came, to, I came here today to mostly talk about play. You might notice I wear it on my hat. And it is the thing that I am the most passionate about. And to find your passion in life, even if it takes 40 years, it is a blessing beyond belief. I, like, I just have to click and you guys laugh. I love it. <laughs> so these are two players from history. Plato was known to play. He liked, uh, he liked to party. We know that from the era he comes from. But he said about play, that you can learn more about a person in one hour of play than in a lifetime of conversation. And Einstein, and I'd love to give a bunch of Einstein quotes, but Einstein referred to play as the highest form of research. In the United States, we have a National Institute for Play, and that institute has pages and pages of data about how valuable play is to us as human beings. At the very beginning, I like to talk about how play inspires vitality. That's the first thing they, they talk about. I'm going to use some examples of very successful people who embody play and the benefits that play provides to us. Sir Richard Branson epitomizes the fact that play generates optimism and it seeks out novelty. No entrepreneur can go without those qualities. Muhammad Ali, the most playful athlete in history, and also the greatest of all time, play generates, uh, play makes perseverance fun, and play also leads to mastery of skills. And finally, Mary Poppins. Play fosters empathy, and it creates a sense of belonging. And also important about Mary Poppins, if you all remember the spoonful of sugar, she wasn't talking about literally sugar helping medicine go down. She was talking about making work fun and how if you make your work fun, whatever it is, it, it almost magically happens. Many a creative agency in the world understands this power of play and they create playful spaces for their employees so that they can get more, more creative work now, Aaron Draplin spoke earlier about his basement where he works without his pants. And so I think Wyden and Kennedy should consider a no pants rule. Because <laughs> I think that, that's generating some good work too. We're all hardwired to play. That's how we come into the world. It is our natural default state. Play is literally the universal language. Google, Google image play and you'll find reams of these examples of children playing with nothing or putting, putting playful situations together with their own creativity. 
The United Nations recognizes the importance of, of play to the point where they have declared it a right of every child. And I want to underline that. Every child. In these past four years, I've gone to a lot of meetings that talk about equity for, for people, and children who experience disability are often being left out of that conversation still. We say the word every, but we don't often mean it. Here's a perfect example of saying something but not necessarily meaning it. It's also an example of a built environment that's falling a little bit short. So I'm, there's a lot I could tell you about what is wrong with the typical playground. Uh, one thing I really want to mention here, what's going on in this picture is what's called prescribed play, right? Certain routes that you must follow, really. It's hard to get creative with this thing. Children might be excited about it for a minute or two, but, but pretty quickly they grow tired of it. Another very weird thing about this is it's designed for kids who don't actually need their wheelchair, wheelchairs. So that's... <laughs> I did not Photoshop him out of there. That, that's, that's in a magazine or in the catalog for playgrounds. That's what they have. So this passion for play, while it took flight four years ago, it really goes back to my mom and dad. This is Herbert Murray Goldberg and Nathalie Ann Goldberg. Circa 1964, they met at the World's Fair in New York City. And like a lot of people of their generation, they headed to San Francisco. <laughs> Two of the original players. <laughs> well, like a lot of people who made San Francisco cool, they, they moved across the Golden Gate Bridge, found a little one-room cabin in the woods, and started to raise a family. This is, the single, this is the only single photo that exists of the four of us. And that's actually because my father was usually behind the camera. This is my sister, Becky, and myself. This is an early girlfriend. <laughs> What's so funny? Is, Every single one of my childhood photos has a big finger in the front. <laughs> and I just, I just thought that everyone's house smelled of this, this funny smell. It was, there was two smells, actually. There was this funny smell, and then there was that Nag Champa uh, incense. <laughs> well, actually, everyone I grew up with, their home smelled the same. This is my kindergarten class. I'm in the front, stage right, left. I got the blue shirt on. And that's my, one of my very dearest friends also holding up the sign. Now, the community I grew up in valued play to the extent that those, those people who moved across the Golden Gate Bridge, they all got involved in local politics. They, they actually ran for school board, and they changed the school system. And they created this thing called the open classroom. And the open classroom was just that. It was open. We, as children, were allowed to decide when we had recess, how long our recess lasted. Sounds pretty crazy, right? I have to say, I really do, do think that this works. When children are allowed to play more, when they finally come to sit down to, to work on schoolwork, it's because it's an intrinsic value that they want to learn. They're not being forced in that moment to learn. And I really believe in this theory. I think no child left behind is more children left behind. Less testing, more play. Another very powerful lesson from my childhood comes from a baseball team that I played against. This is a team, um, again, that I played, played against in Little League. And one of the children on the team had cerebral palsy. This is Xerxes Whitney. And to my recollection, he never got a hit. But he batted every time his turn came up. Not the last inning of the last game of the season for some applause, but he was on the team. This is a, a, this is a memory that sticks with me to this day, and I really believe in this um, with all my heart. This is what should be the norm. So that community, I, thank you. 
So this community I grew up in, the, the most powerful lesson I came away from this community is that, well, I'd like to say a community that values all of its members equally is a treasure. And it's something we should strive towards. I get to skip forward 25 years, especially because the clock is rolling. <laughs> so I traveled the world, went to college, met the girl of my dreams, bought a house, and we were expecting a family. This is my beautiful wife, April, who's sitting right over here. Uh, just a quick round of applause for April. So for any couple, the birth of the first child or any child is um, obviously quite memorable. For us, it was just a tiny bit more memorable. With no drama, I will just explain that there was drama. There was an offer to read Last Rites, which we declined. There was hours of laboring to catch breath. There was a miracle surgery to save our daughter's life. And there was one month in the neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit. About a week after we were allowed to bring our daughter home, they called us back. They wanted to explain the results of genetic testing that they had run. They pointed to this one little tiny piece. I, I mentioned our lives, or for us, it was just a tiny bit different. They explained that our daughter Harper had been born with a very rare genetic difference called Emanuel syndrome. And I'll never forget what they said. They said, you should expect that she will never walk nor talk in her lifetime. And in that very second, I remember thinking, no, 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 don't ever tell anyone to expect anything but a miracle. So what we did is we took our girl home, and quite appropriate to the theme here today, we focused on all, remember all those other bits were perfect. There was just one little tiny extra piece, right? And we focused on how perfect she was. I like to point out these toes. These toes are the most nibbleable toes, <laughs> like little grapes. As Harper grew, we continued to celebrate just how perfect she is. We also learned, though, and I've already kind of alluded to this, we learned about a very powerful part of what is called disability world, and it's that disability world can be very exclusionary. We were excluded from our neighborhood school. They wouldn't even let us try to make it work for Harper. So we became passionate about this thing called inclusion. And as I talked about with Xerxes, inclusion is everywhere, always, everything. That's, how, that's what we believe. It really took root, as the introduction alluded to, when we started taking Harper to our neighborhood park. And we learned a lot about playgrounds just from this experience. There's these ramps into typical playgrounds. We thought those were for the wheelbarrows to bring the wood chips in. Those are actually for people who use wheels to get around to go down into that wood chip zone. Then they're expected to cross the wood chips and using their arm strength, like the miracle kids from the previous playground, <laughs> and pull themselves up onto that silly structure and play somehow, those two elements, that little ramp that goes down into the wood chips and that transfer deck allows the playground industry to call their playgrounds ADA compliant. That didn't satisfy me, and that certainly did not satisfy Harper. <laughs> She was not having it. So we set out to figure, figure out how to build a better playground. And we took a look at the typical adaptive model. We were going to do it. We were on the track to do that. But it just didn't feel right. I mean, that looks about as fun as a rat maze to me. This is, this is the powerful quote for what we're trying to do here. You never change something by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And any child of Northern California 70s has got to be a huge Buckminster Fuller fan anyway. <laughs> so we formed an organization. My background being brand marketing, we created a brand. And we set forth to build a better model and to fund it ourselves. It all starts with design, right? The D in TED is design. To have a seat at the design table uh, for the new playground was one of the rarest treats of my life. This is a thought leader right here, Susan Goltzman, in the concept of adventure playgrounds that are also accessible. And it was at this meeting that I really, 
the first kernel of, of thought that this is going to be my life came about. This meeting would have never happened without my dearest friend, Todd Gervin, who brought Susan on board to the team and then took the notes from the drawing session and created this vision plan. This vision plan changed everything for us. It became the tool that we could use to go out and drum up support. One tiny design element that I really want to focus on here is the fact that we chose sea turtles. The sea turtle is not native to North Portland, Oregon, <laughs> which is usually like a prerequisite when you're designing something. It should really make sense, right? But the sea turtle on land really struggles to get around. It's very difficult for a sea turtle to maneuver. However, in the water, the sea turtle soars like an eagle. And for us, that's the metaphor of the space we created, a place where everyone can soar. This is the drawing that became the vision. And because time is short, I do have a cool video, but we're going to just give you a little taste of what it's like to go through the space. Um, so roll video, please. And that's not it. <laughs> so maybe that's good, because I should really keep rolling. So let's skip the video, if we can. So that's the space. Imagine going through it. <laughs> and let me just say, here's what's key. There's not a step on site. It's smooth surfacing throughout the whole space. So anyone who uses wheels can get anywhere anyone else can. How were we going to pay for this thing? We started with a bake sale. Right in front of our house, $750. And from that single, simple bake sale, we raised $1.2 million in just two and a half years. We pursued media relentlessly, and we got it. We turned our living room into a t-shirt production house. We raffled off a Cadillac. <laughs> and, and not just any ca Cadillac, that was my Cadillac <laughs> that I had to let go. We got an army behind us. <laughs> Kickoff is in about half past turquoise, so go Timbers. This moment right here, this moment represented three years of, as David mentioned, lunch hours, evenings, weekends, but also what it represented, four memorial funds were donated to Harper's Playground. Three bar and bat mitzvahs, two lemonade stands, and one little girl who inspired it. We cut the ribbon, and you know what happened? <laughs> it's true. If Feel the dreams. Ghosts of baseball players came to the park. <laughs> People came and they enjoyed themselves of all abilities and of all ages. This photo on the left was posted to our Facebook page and just shows a little bit of what you can get at Harper's Playground. Wet sand, playing with musical instruments. And this quote of, is one of hundreds we've received. Thank you for changing the landscape of my daughter's childhood. That feels profound. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. This one to me, this photo alone would have made all of that effort worth it. Level ground together, new friendships. I love this. People have adopted the park. They helped build it. Now they're taking care of it. Cleanup parties are happening spontaneously, and people are purchasing toys and leaving them at the sand area. A year after we opened the park, the Today Show did a feature on us. And we received hundreds and hundreds of emails from people asking us to help them repeat our model. And that's what we wanted to do, but we were not quite prepared for the onslaught. One message in particular came from a family in Bainbridge Island, Washington. Their son, Owen, who's pictured here, had recently passed. And they wanted to take his memorial fund to build a park like Harper's Playground, and they asked us to help. And that was the one we knew we must help with. That leads to me quitting my job. If you, know, if you remember Say Anything, Lloyd Dobler never wanted to sell anything produced or produce anything for sale. 
That's how I felt. So now I get to say I build playgrounds. The hottest song on the radio today is Happiness is the Truth, I think, by Pharrell. I just want to end by saying, if you remember your sophomore geometry, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, I think. <laughs> well, I say that play equals happiness, and happiness equals the truth, and we all know that the truth is love. So what the world needs more of is more people making more play. Thank you very much. So sorry.